The Blucher was one of the five Admiral Hipper class heavy cruisers that were a part of Germany's war navy force. This video will outline the events that transpired, causing the now wrecked Blucher to remain at the bottom of the Oslo Fjord for over eight decades. The number of battleships and cruisers Germany could have in its military was limited by the Treaty of Versailles following World War I. The battleships that were authorized as well had major size and power restrictions. However, after Germany officially rejected the Treaty of Versailles in the mid-1930s, the German Navy, also known as the Kriegsmarine, began developing the Admiral Hipper class. The Admiral Hipper class was a set of cruisers that would assist lead ships into combat in the German Navy's goal for European domination. This development would mark the beginning of their comeback to military dominance in the area. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland, marking the beginning of the most destructive war known to mankind, World War II. Despite France and Great Britain declaring war on Germany in early October, both the German and Soviet armies gained full control of Poland. In late November 1939, the Soviet Red Army invaded Finland, which was formerly a part of the Russian Empire and gained control of some part of the territory. This seizure of power was called the Winter War. Additionally, towards the end of 1939, the German Führer came to the realization that Germany could potentially benefit from the strategic neutrality of the Scandinavian countries of Sweden and Norway. The reasoning for this was simple. The majority of Germany's war supplies depended on the supply of iron ore from Sweden. Therefore, Germany relied heavily on Swedish iron ore to prepare for the invasion of France, as well as the campaign on the Western Front. The supply of this iron ore occurred through two trade routes. The first route started from the mining towns of Jelleveri and Kiruna and culminated at a Swedish port of Luleå. From there, the ore was sent to Germany through the Baltic Sea. As the town of Lulior received heavy snowfall during the months of December to April, therefore, Germany could not rely on this singular route to supply iron ore, and the majority of iron ore supply happened through the Norwegian route. Additionally, France and Britain were well aware that Germany was highly dependent on this supply of iron ore to be successful in the war. This led to Britain heavily monitoring the ore being exported from Sweden and controlling the North Sea through the home fleet of the Royal Navy. Britain also pressured German shipping activity occurring in the North Sea through Operation Wilfred. Britain launched Operation Wilfred as a way to instigate a German response in Norway. By January of 1940, Navy Chief Ryder was convinced that Britain wanted to occupy Norway in order to completely block or delay all exports from the Norwegian-Swedish territory to Germany. Owing to this, the German High Command feared that Britain might violate Norwegian neutrality in order to mobilize its forces to launch an ambush attack on the German-controlled northern part. Following this, Germany began work on their next largest ship, the Bismarck one of the most formidable battleships of its day, just a few years after the Admiral Hipper. On the 16th of February 1940, British naval forces captured the German tanker Altmark and sailed south of Stavanger, Josingford. The ship was attacked by the British destroyer Cossack. As a result of this attack, eight German sailors were killed and about 299 British sailors were rescued from the Altmark. This incident prompted the Führer and the German High Command to reconsider Norway's neutrality. Therefore, Norway could no longer maintain its neutral status even if it wanted to. On the 21st of February 1940, the Führer ordered the German High Command to come up with a plan to invade Norway. This was named Operation Veserable, and the main objective of this operation was to prevent the Allied forces from taking control of Norwegian waters and to secure the supply of iron ore occurring through the Norwegian waters. The German High Command allocated six naval units for this operation and placed utmost importance to the capture of the capital city of Oslo. 
This was done through ambush attacks planned to occur simultaneously through sea and through air. In 1940, Norway was under a constitutional monarchical rule under King Hakon VII, who continued to rule Norway after its independence in 1905. The Führer's strategy to establish control over Scandinavian countries was to plant a puppet within the Norwegian government, who would carry out Germany's orders. This would allow Germany to seep through hierarchical cracks slowly but steadily and establish supremacy over the Scandinavian countries and position the Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine up for success in the German war operations to the north. They planned to occupy all locations of strategic importance through amphibious landings backed by troops of paratroopers. Between the 3rd and the 7th of April, three groups of supply ships and tankers had departed from the German ports. On the 8th of April, the warship named Group 5, carrying around 2,000 personnel, set sail toward the north in an attempt to peacefully occupy the Norwegian capital of Oslo, mid good weather and cloudless skies. On the same day, the opposing two forces set sail toward Bergen and Kristiansand. Since all the German ships that were involved in Operation Veserabung were at sea, there was no way for them to return to the mainland. Meanwhile, Group 5 was advancing toward Oslo at a speed of 18 knots. It consisted of two German heavy cruisers, namely the Blucher and the Lutzo, the light cruiser named the Emden, three torpedo boats and support ships. At around 6.10 p.m., the fleet of ships were about 20 miles north of Skien, and the Blucher was ahead in line stern with the other ships in the fleet. As the darkness of midnight draped over Norway, the German troops secretly entered Norwegian territory without incident at first. Following this, the Norwegian auxiliary patrol boat named Pal III was patrolling the outer boundaries of the Oslo Fjord. This patrol boat fired a warning shot at the German troops, following which it approached a German torpedo boat named Albatross. At approximately 11.25 p.m., the Rye Fort searchlight spotted the German fleet. This led to a series of warning shots being fired from both sides. Taking advantage of the poor visibility conditions, the German troops were able to disappear from the view of the Norwegian forces. The first sign of the intrusion of unidentified ships into the outer region of the Oslo Fjord was seen at around 11.30 p.m. from Karl Johansvern Horten and was sent to Oskarsborg, but the German troops were able to pass through Norwegian defences at the outer Oslo Fjord without any major loss of personnel. To gain complete control of the capital city of Oslo, the German troops had to successfully navigate through the main line of defence located at Oskarsborg. The most dangerous point of this northbound trip to the capital was the Drobak Narrows, the Oskarsborg Fortress, which was located on the South Kolman Island at the centre of the fjord about 10 miles south of the capital, defended the Drawback Narrows, using three 28cm Krupp-made guns. These guns were operated manually and had no protective cover. Two 57mm Oswick-based guns were also positioned on the east side of the fjord, north of the settlement of Drobak. This provided Drobak Narrows with a powerful defence. On a dark and foggy night, Colonel Berger K. R. Eriksson, the garrison commander at Oskarsbo, could deploy three 28cm cannons to repel a moving unknown target with just two sergeants and 23 young recruits. On board the Blucher, Konter Admiral Oskar Kummetz made the decision to enter the narrow space at around 3.30 a.m just before the sun began to rise. At around 3.40 a.m., two Norwegian auxiliary boats were patrolling at the head of the Narrows and were able to spot German ships entering the Filtvet. These auxiliaries were able to send news of the intrusion to Oskarsborg, which had no radar facilities at the time and had to spot the German troops purely with the naked eye. As it was still dark, they could only vaguely see the two German ships illuminated only by floodlights. The Drobak Narrows were further monitored by a powerful searchlight called Kranfotoy No. 2, which was a crane vessel located on the eastern side of the fjord. At around 4.15 a.m., 
the searchlight spotted the German ship Blucher. This ship, which was laid down in August 1936 and launched in 1937, was more than 660 feet long, 70 feet broad, and carried enough armaments to capture a port city. The German cruiser Blucher had three sets of steam turbines powered by 12 ultra-high-pressure oil-fired boilers. She could cruise at 32 knots with this power. After hundreds of training exercises in the late 1930s, the Germans pronounced her battle-ready and she was promptly named the flagship in Operation Vesterbung. The main aim of Operation Vesterbung was to seize Oslo, Norway's capital. Over 1,000 Navy personnel boarded the ship, including hundreds from the 163rd Infantry Division, who would disembark in Oslo to capture the city on foot. The commander of the Norwegian troops, Oberst Birger Eriksen, was unaware whether the ship approaching belonged to the Germans or to the Allied forces. While he was aware that Norway maintained a neutral stance in the war, he was also informed that Norway was inclined to support the Allied forces if it ultimately came down to it. Aside from the officers and NCOs, practically all of the soldiers guarding the area were new recruits having been inducted only seven days prior to the attack. Additionally, the fortress's naval mines were not deployed on the day of the attack due to the surge in the number of inexperienced personnel in the area. As a result of these shortcomings, Oberst Birger Eriksen had no choice but to wait and allow the ship to get closer. Oberst Birger Eriksen was also aware that under Norway's pre-war neutralization rules, he was forbidden from firing at the approaching ship out of anger or haste. He instead had to fire a warning shot. However, this warning shot had already been fired hours earlier by the troops at the entrance to the outer fjord. Finally, at 4.21 a.m., when the Blucher was around 1,000 yards from his troops, Oberst Birger Eriksen ordered his troops to open fire on his own accord. The first round of gunfire hit and severely damaged the tower of the ship and rendered one of the cannons unusable. After this, another gun fires, colliding with the hangar under the plane. The devastating effect of two heavy shells was visible. Simultaneously, firing began to commence from the Kopas and Husvik batteries, which were the secondary Norwegian coastal batteries, wreaking further havoc on the already damaged ship. Shell pieces from the Norwegian cannons also knocked out Blucher's firefighting equipment, making attempts to contain the fires inside the ship and rescue the numerous injured considerably more difficult and dangerous. The Husvik battery, however, had to be evacuated when the Blucher passed it and fired into it, causing the main building to go up in flames. There were no casualties as a result of this fire. In total, Approximately 13 15 cm rounds and 30 57 mm shells were fired at the German cruiser as it passed through the secondary Norwegian batteries. At some point after this, the crew aboard the Blucher began to chant, and it was only then that the Norwegian troops knew that they had opened fire on a German ship. The return fire from Blucher was unsuccessful, and the fight barely lasted five to seven minutes. The cruiser was blazing and heavily damaged. The Blucher caught Commander Captain Anderson's attention when she glided past the torpedo battery at a distance of barely 500 meters. The torpedoes he decided to use were 40-year-old Whitehead torpedo weapons made in Austria-Hungary. At around 4.30, Commander Captain Anderson launched the torpedoes. Because Anderson had slightly miscalculated his target speed, the first torpedo struck near Blucher's front turret, causing relatively little damage. The aim of the second torpedo launch was rectified, and the torpedo impacted Blucher amidships, striking the same general region as the first 28-centimeter shell. This caused catastrophic damage to the cruiser, and the engines could barely pay attention. At 4.40, the commander of the heavy cruiser Lutzow after seeing the flagship in a heavy attack, decided to take the invading forces out of range of the Oscars Ball batteries. Meanwhile, Kopas and Husvik batteries also repeatedly attacked her, causing many damage as well. 
The Blucher stopped near the Askolmena Islands, well north and out of the field of fire of the fort's guns, to try to combat the intense flames blazing throughout the vessel after the second torpedo strike knocked out all engines. Blucher's torpedoes were launched against land to prevent them from exploding in the ship's uncontrolled flames. The crew's fight came to an end at 5.30, when flames reached a midship ammunition store for the 10.5 centimeter flak guns, blowing a massive hole in the ship's side. The fire caused the bulkheads connecting the boiler rooms to go up in flames and ripped open the cruiser's fuel bunkers, causing several more fires to break out within the cruiser. At 6.30, there was a big explosion as a magazine flew away. A large pillar of smoke rose into the sky. At approximately 7 a.m., the Blucher tilted 45 degrees before turning upside down and finally sinking into the water. Around 30 minutes after this, the cruiser was completely submerged underwater. Personnel who were unable to get to the shore within 20 minutes of hitting the water were at risk of succumbing to frostbite in the icy cold fjord. In total, around 1,000 German personnel lost their lives as a result of this incident. Around 500 heavy Luftwaffe bombs were dropped onto the fort later in the day. Some of these bombs fell close to the 28-centimeter guns, and these guns were covered in rock fragments and dirt when the bombs went off. But other than this, no damage was done. By contrast, other bombs fell into the fort's buildings, causing excessive damage. No casualties were recorded as a result of this bombing. The events that transpired that morning prevented Oslo from being captured long after the German attack, allowing the Norwegian royal family, members of the parliament and cabinet members to escape to safety. Additionally, Norway's gold reserves were also moved out of the capital and sent to the Allies, who were to keep them safe for Norway to use during the war. Ultimately, the city of Oslo was captured later in the day by airlifted forces at the Fornebu airport. As a result of this, Colonel Eriksson decided that further battle without assistance would be in vain and agreed to cease fire on the German troops in the evening of April the 9th. On the 10th of April, the fort had surrendered to German troops. A hundred-year-old stronghold, manned by raw recruits and retirees, and armed with 40 to 50-year-old weapons of German and Austro-Hungarian manufacture, had destroyed a ship whose crew was still finishing training in one of the war's most unusual confrontations. Oscar's Bowl had completed its purpose by preventing an invader from entering the capital. 